beautifully done there by Melissa Rico, who is a Broadway star in her own right and mm -hmm. also Goodness. the wife, the partner of Patrick McEnroe, an American tennis legend. How who's, about a, who's, another American <laughs> tennis Hello. legend, Jim Hi. Carrier? I finally Welcome. bullied my way onto your yes, show. Yes, you did. Yes. You just in. I've been we lobbying love to be on this show yes. all week. Can you finally, well, tournament. It's great to see all of you. How's, How's everyone good doing? Thanks for stopping by. I mean, I'm just so thrilled that we don't have to have headbands and wristbands on. It's a cool no, U.S. Open got, this year. But no we've rain got all today. Sorts of props we've, yeah, going we've got on some today. props today. We'll yeah. get to those. Actually, props are you good. mentioned that we've been talking about that a lot, Jim. This is the most temperate U.S. Open in how long? It, uh, probably as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. and, and think about how amazing Wimbledon was this year too. Wimbledon was the best Beautiful. weather I could remember since 1993. So. Uh, we, we've gotten lucky. Last year was brutally hot for yes, the players, for the fans, for even all of us who are, <laughs> yeah. who are here <laughs> promoting it. Yeah, lights, so it's exactly. great to be with, with you all here and to, uh, to be enjoying a, what's been a great U.S. Open so far. Well, Jim, we have a lot of tennis fans obviously watching, but we also have some non-tennis fans great. popping in and out. If you had to give them a nice little tip about, you know, just the behind the scenes, what makes this place so special, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, we spent time in yes, Fan we Week, did. Nick, which is, which is if you're just looking to get an experience of the U.S. Open and you just want to come in a casual environment, first of all, it's free to the public. Second of all, all the top players are practicing and get up close to them, get some autographs. It's a great way to bring families under the tennis tent, if you will. So uh, the yeah. USTA, I think, is doing a wonderful job of helping to make the US Open more accessible to more people. Um, because it, it, of course, is a business and it makes a lot of money for, for tennis in America. And the tickets can be a bit more expensive here as we get to week two. But it's been uh, it's been wonderful to see how this event has grown over the years and, and morphed into more than just tennis, too. The musical elements have become a part of it. There's great food here now. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they just made it a lot more spacious, a lot more comfortable. And it's been uh, it's been really fantastic to see it evolve because, frankly, when I was first playing this tour, yeah. this was by far the least comfortable major for really? players to really? play in. By far, our expand why? Well, our locker rooms were on top of an, we're in the indoor center. The the players' food was they laid a carpet literally on top of a couple of indoor tennis courts, and it was just a buffet of food <laughs> that was nowhere near the the options that they have now. And it was really uncomfortable, cramped, small. Uh, uh, it was old, frankly, yeah. the, and this there's so much that's been renovated and and new as well. The grandstand court is just an amazing option, as well as the little details like having the the grandstands at the practice court, so people mm -hmm. can go and see the players in that more relaxed environment. So, all in all, um, you know this tournament has continued to to become more popular, mm -hmm. but it's also become more comfortable, which is a really nice combination. Mm. I like that. Yeah, Jim, it's my first time here. We've been talking about this uh, all week on the U.S. Open, so I'm like, I'm the newbie. I'm the rookie uh, on the crew as far as U.S. Open uh, experience is concerned, but you were touching on it just now, just how much um, this tournament and, and the grounds have really evolved. I mean, when you look at when you were playing and to now, what do you think is the biggest I guess biggest improvement. You mentioned a lot of them, but what do you think, you know, makes the biggest impact? I think it's just the attention to detail on so many different things. There's so many improvements for the fans. The food options are, are so much great. There's so much more space for them. Putting the grandstand in this bottom left-hand corner, that's pushed people all around the grounds. Yep. We used to be all crowded around Louis Armstrong Stadium and the old grandstand court, which was attached to it. So yeah. there is really a big log jam now. There's just a lot more breathing room for people. And then from a player standpoint, Point, they've just gotten so much right as far as making sure that it's because we're in an era now where it's, you're not just one player and one coach and maybe a, a spouse or a, or a, uh, an agent. The entourages, the kids, amount of kids people, now. kids, kids yeah. lots of kids. There's so many more people around the player section, so they've they've expanded that as well. And they have different coffee areas because that's become a big part of not just a culture in, in this country, but certainly tour culture. A lot of people revolve around having their coffee at different times of the day. So they have one downstairs in the players area, one upstairs in the players area, and another one in the player restaurant. So they, they're just nice. doing a lot of the details. The recovery rooms are, are much different. We I used to have to go for a jog after a match and people thought that I was crazy for doing it. It was just simply a cool down. Mm -hmm. Now you see Nadal get off, off this match court, go in, take his shirt off, show off his abs, can't blame him. <laughs> and, and, he get, looking good. and he gets on the bike and he just starts, you know, pedaling Puts softly. And she, yeah, yeah, you know the whole rhythm oh, yeah. rhyme that what he does. Well. But uh, and it's nice that also these days that, that the USTA and, and all the tournaments these days are trying to push to give fans more access to see those moments. Those behind the scene moments are really special. And Jim, that's what we've been 
doing on US Open now, we've actually been showing Rafa in his pre-match, which has been really fun. Mm. And he's been doing a lot of wall sits. We realized that he does about four to five wall sits before his match, mm -hmm. and he times them on his phone, 45 seconds. Yep. We think we think it's to strengthen the knees to get those muscles you, around the Do you knees. do wall sits? Uh, maybe one or two in my life. <laughs> Feel, uh, uh, three words for you. Feel the burn. Yeah. Because that's what you get. I it can't, it I can't lights the quads and the hamstrings and the glutes up. And obviously, it, Rafa, his, his lower section, he's so strong there. Uh, there he is. This getting is him loose, getting, getting ready for it. Ready for it. He's so explosive. He needs it. to be ready to go from first ball. Cause think about it. He explodes after the ball toss. Uh, after the coin toss. Sure. He explodes the baseline. The baseline. So, so there's no uh, no easy move into it for Rafa. He's got to be ready from the first ball. Jim, you've been sorry, Prim. You've been having some. You mentioned the coffee there. You've been having some early mornings yourself. How's your U.S. Open been? Uh, it's been uh, fabulous. We, yeah. we do the Tennis Channel live show like you guys. We're, we're in it from first ball, and we're here. Uh, we get here before first ball, actually. I get here at 7 every morning. Our show wow. starts at 8 o'clock and 8 to 11. And Tennis Channel, we have a, a wonderful family that we get to work with. Uh, Lindsay Davenport, Martina, Mary Carrillo, Brett Haber, John Wertheim, Paul Anacone. Uh, and you I'm, forgot I'm, anyone, you're in trouble. I, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Big team. <laughs> but we work together all year long, too. Yeah. So it's it's fun for us to get together and just talk shop. It's I'm sure what you guys are doing here every day. You just kind of talk about things that you're passionate about and you're really interested in. And hopefully give fans at home a chance to get set for what's to come for the day before they tune into ESPN for all that coverage. And, and we've got them on the back end on Tennis Channel. With the, the post-match, we've got the replay if you missed anything. So um, there's never been a better time to be a tennis fan in America. It's all covered all the time. Now, are you able to get back out onto the tennis court during the U.S. Open because there's so many former players, some of your colleagues here? So, so Prim, I was lucky enough during Fan Week to play an exhibition with John McEnroe on Louis Armstrong yes. Stadium. So awesome. I haven't been able to hit since then because my schedule is just a little, it's so a little no tricky. Wall, no wall sits. Like no that. wall sits. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no wall sits. I, I try and get home at, at, at night and, and uh, you know, pick my kids up. That's my version of the wall sit. You that's know, good, that's, fire that's my, good enough. Yeah, fire my. What about you? Are you playing? Are you, you I after actually it? am. Yeah. yeah. Actually, tomorrow we're going to try to do a little step by step warm up demo to show people, nice. you know, because we've been showing little bits and pieces. We've we've been spying on Rafa the entire time with the <laughs> wall sits. You want to join us? I'm going to join Mark Lucero. It's going to be him and I. Uh, I love Don't Mark. look at me. Yeah, I, I love know. Mark. We just have our last TC live show tomorrow. Tomorrow's uh, not a great day oh, for so me. Oh, so you're going to bounce. And I'm calling, okay. well, I'm calling matches during the day too okay. for Amazon Jim's Prime. Jim's kind of busy. So I know. Wow. I know. Many going. Time too. That's yeah, great. second year doing Prime Video for the UK. So I'll be calling, I'll be calling the Stan uh, Medvedev match day with Mark Petchy and John Ooh. McEnroe. So we'll be in a three booth just chitter chattering away. Watch nice. out for the booze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the right. booze will rain today. We Bronx think cheers? So, right? You think they're coming to Queens? N no. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. Are those Bronx cheers Bronx equal cheers booze? is a boo. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah. they're coming. Yeah. They're here in Queens. They've okay. been here all week, right? Yes, they have. The last two rounds for Medvedev. <laughs> Bring it on. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I keep saying. <laughs> I want to ask you just about the state of American tennis and and the especially on the women's side yep. and, and so many exciting young players we've been watching. You know, unfortunately, some of them are no longer playing in this tournament. But what excites you about what you're seeing uh, from these young people? right well, now? Well, we've seen a young American generation in the male side come through led by Francis Tiafo and Taylor Fritz and Riley Opelka, who are all in the top 50. And now we see a few years younger than that this young generation coming through obviously Coco Goff is getting a lot of the headlines and Katie McNally has had a breakout summer and they've been a wonderful doubles partnership but you also have players like Whitney Osigwe and what about Amanda Anisimova let's not forget about her fabulous yeah. run at the French Open and we send our best thoughts to her and her time of sadness her father passing away is why she's not playing this tournament so hopefully she'll regroup and there are other players too Haley Baptiste and another player that that really played well in Washington DC and they're all vibing off of each other oh, they're yeah. gelling off of each other and it's great when you get that cluster that collective because they can also take a little bit of the pressure off of each other share the spotlight a little bit and I mean look, how great is Taylor Townsend to see <laughs> that also I mean the way that the style that she's bringing yeah. unbelievable I mean, she and Katie both love the net so there's a lot of uh, ver variety in the game styles as well and a lot to like um, you know and that's obviously we're lucky enough we have Madison and we have Sloan too and, and of course Venus and Serena still doing it it's a very a very healthy time in American women's tennis right now and a lot to love about what's coming up from the, the youth movement. 
There was, well, there's a few players in their mid to late 30s. There was a guy you played, I think, in his late 30s in 1991. What do, you, what do you remember of that run? It was the yeah. year that you made the final here, and I think it was a big U.S. Open for you when you beat Jimmy Connors sure. in that semifinal run. So this, this used to be the parking lot where we used to was enter it? the U.S. Open and then walk to the grounds to get onto. So we're standing in the parking lot. I remember getting out of my car and having CBS cameras right in my face that day, which is the first time that had ever happened. Okay. And I remember going, oh, this is going to be a different day. And I knew that intuitively because Jimmy had completely taken over the tournament. No one knows that Stefan Edberg won the U.S. Open that year. They only remember <laughs> Jimmy Connors. That's, that's and, true, actually. And that's right. very true. And by the way, that's fine because Jimmy earned that. He put tennis on not the front of the sport pages, but the front page of all the newspapers in the country. It was an amazing time. And the reality was that Jimmy had spent a lot of physical and mental energy en route to the semifinals, and I hadn't. I hadn't dropped the set, so I had a really big physical advantage there. But you could see there's more relief than excitement in my <laughs> face because I was really concerned about Jimmy getting the crowd involved, Nick. Mm. I was really fearful of that. Yeah, that's actually kind of what I wanted to ask you. I'm, I'm not comparing it to sort of the medvedev Vavrinka situation, but when you're walking out there, as you did that day, the whole crowd was for Jimmy Connors mm -hmm. because of the story. Almost. I, I Almost. Got, so you I got, got a couple people. I got 10 free tickets. 10 so free tickets. Okay. So you had 10. So there 10 were, people going There were 11. <laughs> we'll throw you a bone. There were 11 people oh, cheering okay. for Jim <laughs> that yeah. day. How did you approach that situation? Well, I, I approached it like I would a Davis Cup match. I knew going in that I wasn't going to get the crowd support, and it was my goal to try and get a lead early to at least stifle the crowd because I, I knew if Jimmy got in front that he would, he, he would use their energy and their momentum, and they were just itching to get on his side. They were itching to get behind him, but I was able to get an early break in the first set, and he made a push in the second set. I was able to get back on serve, but I just remember knowing, especially, you know, back then we used to walk from the player, uh, the player area was the indoor center, and there was this uh, rope line that you would walk to from from there to the entrance to Armstrong Stadium. Yep. It wasn't like today where the players are shielded from the audience. You mm. walk st uh, right through the middle of them, and it's like the Red Sea parting for Jimmy Connors, and there I am bashfully going by with my head down trying just to get to the court and get that part over with. So it was a really intimidating experience for me, and, and I was fortunate enough to get that lead and kind of calm my nerves down early in the match. Mm. Um, so now you have two kids. Two. Two. So I'm curious, um, because tennis was such a huge part of your life, and I know that um, it, it was really a huge part of your childhood, and also you had a little brother that we, sure. uh, Chris and I played at Saddlebrook together. Oh, yeah. He was a really good baseball player. He's here today. Is he? He will be tonight. I haven't, yeah, seen, yeah. Him. I haven't seen him in 30 years. I'll try and bring him back. <laughs> yeah, bring him over here. Um, so I'm curious, do you want them to play tennis? And oh, if yeah. they do, how serious is are they going to be in terms of playing tennis? So my wife, Susanna, and I are both tennis people. She played D1 college tennis and played in the Futures and Challengers. So we both come from this world, and we're both comfortable in it. And we were both placed into tennis, but really of our own volition. It wasn't like our parents pushed us necessarily. And that's our philosophy. Our kids are almost five and almost three. We have two little boys, and they both have rackets. They're very particular. That's my racket. No, that's my racket. <laughs> very particular. But they also have golf clubs and baseball bats Good. and soccer balls, and they have yep. musical instruments and crayons. And we're providing options for them. Mm -hmm. That's our philosophy. Uh, it's not a right or wrong philosophy. It's just what's right for us. And they do like tennis. It's a part of our world. They, we have obviously we have tennis on and on the TV all the time. And I play with Susanna a lot when we're home in Orlando uh, to get ready for Invesco series events and stuff like that. And so they see it, but we don't want them to do it because we want them to do it. Mm -hmm. We want them to enjoy it and embrace it. And if I just would like them to be able to play tennis at, at, an, at an age at any time in their life, kind of like learning how to ride a bike where you learn how to do it as a kid and you never forget. Mm -hmm. I like them to have reasonable techniques so they can enjoy it if they want to. And the same thing for golf and swimming lessons and all of those things. And if they want to go out and pursue tennis, then I will, then Susanna will fall in lockstep with people like Lindsay Davenport and her husband and Mary Jo Fernandez and her husband whose kids are playing high-level junior tournaments and, and will make the same kind of sacrifices that our parents did. So, so what, at what point do you start pushing them? If, never. if they never, never. No. No, okay. I don't believe in pushing them. I mean, if they, if they're interested and passionate about mm -hmm. it, we'll you want be it to there. Come from we'll, them. Yeah, I do. I want it to be organic for them. If it's not a passion, it will never stick. 
Yeah, it's an interesting conversation because we see, uh, especially today um, in youth sports, the over-specialization and mm -hmm. starting tennis mm -hmm. or any other sport at such a young age and just focusing on that. Um, but, it, you know, it's an interesting conversation to see how Do you have kids? I just had my 11th month year old, yeah. Good for you. What's yeah. your philosophy? Um, it's early doors, am, but what's your philosophy? Yeah, so I am kind of in the camp of exposing them to a lot of different things because there's a lot of research in sports science out there that says that it's important for kids to play multiple sports because it makes you a better athlete as opposed to just focusing on one sport, which then eventually leads to burnout <laughs> and injuries. Don't get me started. It's a big topic. Yeah. I digress. So I, I am definitely in the camp of, of, you know, playing multiple things. But I guess it's a question of, you know, is there a point where kids need to learn work ethic and at some point they need to be guided in sure. terms of like, you know, to be pushed a little bit, a little bit more. Well, there, there's certainly that balance. I, I was the kid growing up that if you put a wall in front of me and gave me a ball, I was happy. I would stay there until yeah, you told that, me I had to leave. That was you too. <laughs> that's all I did. Me, yeah. I, I will never play as much tennis against the actual person as I did against the wall. <laughs> oh I had thousands God. of hours. Really? The wall never misses. And I was undefeated against the wall. <laughs> really? Yeah, baby. I never won against the wall. <laughs> Perspective. Yeah. Grand Slam champion, yeah. tennis host. Uh, but yeah. that said, I mean, yeah. you're talking about, you know, playing sports and specifically tennis at a young age, what what do you think that you learn from tennis that has helped you in just life in general? It's, it's a great question. Uh, I think that you learn a lot of self-reliance from tennis because it is a sport where most of the time you're out there alone and you have to problem solve. And one of the things also when you play it at a competitive level, there, there's a real you know, black and whiteness to it, it's binary. You win or you lose, so mm -hmm. you learn how to deal with winning, and mm -hmm. you also learn how to deal with losing. Now, in real life, most people have a nine to five job. The wins and the losses don't come as quickly. It takes longer to develop whatever yeah. you're trying to achieve, and, and you don't see that quick result. But I still think that having the ability to process the emotions of the moment have helped me deal with stressful moments in other areas of my life. Because mm -hmm. life yeah. will throw some curveballs at you. Yeah. And being able to um, hide your anger or hide your, your pain on the tennis court has helped me be able to sort of navigate through some situations and, and uh, I think be better at dealing with the things that come at you in life. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a wonderful sport and there's so many values that you get from being on a team, which which also are incredibly relevant to the real world. Obviously, in the family, you have to learn how to make sacrifices for each other for the better collective, and the same thing in business. I mean, you guys are doing a great job of passing the ball here on, on your show, and that's you, you guys are working that's as a team. That's why this works, though, yeah. because we're you're trying. unafraid we're to trying. pass the ball. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I know one of your... You don't have any stress from uh, social media, as nope. I understand, nope. because you're, you're not on free. it. I'm anti-social media. You're anti-social media. <laughs> I love that. Uh, anti-social so yeah. media. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just, okay. <laughs> that uh -huh. said, we did, uh, I, 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 and we're crowdsourcing from the fans for, for some sure. questions for you. Okay. So you you haven't seen these, obviously, because okay. you would you would not see them what if you're the not on social. What are the fans saying? Ooh, let's see. Oh, this is a long Quite one. Quite a few shots, okay. Oh, so, yeah, so sometimes Roger does get a little bit off interesting mm -hmm. so timing we did see that actually in the first months. couple rounds right. Jim so so not a match point at Wimbledon actually uh, look I think that Roger had a period of time before he switched to the the 97 inch racket where it was more common his forehand in particular he was a little bit off with at times and there are, there are occasions where he gets under stress and sometimes he may pull up off of the ball and not yeah. drive through it and not center it perfectly uh, I wish we were all lucky enough to make those kinds of mistakes <laughs> compared to what he normally does, right? I mean, we're really yeah. nitpicking with Roger if we're worried about about those. Um, he's had incredible longevity. He's an amazingly clean ball striker most of the time. But that's just a, I guess that just goes to show you that even the, the player who's al almost perfect has imperfections at times. He's been able to really play his way into the tournament. Yeah. How impressed have you been? I mean, he's dropped five oh. games in the last two, or excuse me, what was it, nine games in the last two matches? Well, his last match against Goffin was amazing. Uh, that's two top 15, 16 players playing against each other. And the total scoreboard, if we're looking at it from uh, an NBA standpoint, sure. it was 83 mm. to 39. I can't recall ever <laughs> wow. seeing a more lopsided <laughs> match in a round of 16. Can you imagine, like, first round of the NBA, if a team beat a team with that score? Line, it would just yeah. be jaw-dropping, and that's what that performance was. And some of it was Goffin going away at the end of the match, too, but Roger very, very crisp, and now he'll go up with uh, Dimitrov tonight.
Oh, here's a hot another. topic. That's from good. Josh. That's a good question. Uh, do you like coaching? If yes, which player would you choose? Mm -hmm. Except Roger Novak and Rafa. Oh, so not oh, one of I the big three. Oh, I was reading three. Roger Novak or Rafa. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could ask both ways. Yep. Well, pick those three and then pick uh, outside of those three. I do like coaching Josh, and if you'd like to coach me to be better on television, I'm open to all suggestions. <laughs> um, He's just not on social media, Josh, so you're going to have to find his email. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, look, it's an interesting question. If you really wanted to be in the problem-solving business, um, Sasha Zverev is an interesting, he's obviously oh. incredibly gifted, and he's obviously going through a challenging time if yep. you've watched him play this summer. His second serve, he's lost a lot of confidence in it. So that would be an interesting challenge for a coach, I think, to tackle. And I'm sure a lot of people that are in the coaching business will have their hands up to try and help if he and his dad decide they want some outside counsel. Um, gosh, there's so many fun ones, you know. What I mean, about yeah. among the big three? Uh, amongst the big three? Yeah. They don't need any help. <laughs> they, they, you had to choose one. Who would you choose? Uh, or choose yeah. one like in their early development. Look, I, I'll tell you the one go, go. the one that I'm built most similarly to similarly mm. to from a mentality standpoint would be Nadal. Mm. I was always built with that bullish mentality in my uh, so I relate to his style and his approach probably more than I do Rogers. I don't know how it would be like to have it that easy. It just does, that doesn't hard for me to connect with that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Novak's game is so balanced and my backhand was so awful. How would I relate to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind a little company while he's doing his five wall sits for 45 seconds. Yeah, yeah that's how you match. warm up yeah. for your time on set, right? Neg wall neg sets? Neg <laughs> negative, negative. But has, has Charlie Moya been doing any wall sits? He he's, hasn't. He's, he's just been hanging fit. out. Yeah, he's he been just on just his hanging phone. Out. He did a coffee around. segment with one of our reporters. So <laughs> He's over at the coffee bar. He's having a good time. He's drinking some Lavazza. Um, I, I know you mentioned Davis Cup earlier, and, and I think we have some 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 footage. We just like that excuse we just to like bring up old, old footage. footage. Oh, that's my brother Chris. That was Chris yeah. watching, and he's oh, the one here magic. today. That was in that was in Fort Worth, Texas, against Jakob Lasic. I love Dude, that shirt. Look at that outfit. Yeah. yeah, it's like the old referee shirt. Huh? Yeah, it is. Yes. No, it's great look stuff. Look at the white shorts. Yeah, Andy Roddick was in the crowd that day. Also, as about a ten-year-old, he was one of the guys no up way. in the stands. Blowing Agassi, an air look at horn. Him. Look at that head of lettuce. Yeah, yeah. Look Rick Leach. Okay, Rick Leach yeah, in there else? as well. Is uh, Johnny Mac in there? Johnny Mac, Pete Sampras. There's Rick. There's Ricky, wow. yeah. Tom Gorman, our he captain. Picks you oh, up. my yeah. gosh. Yeah. That was amazing. I thought they were going to so drop me. Who was this against? Uh, this this was against Switzerland. This okay. was in Fort Worth, Texas in 1992. There's Bob Russo, our, our wow. trainer. Lasik was being consoled. Mark Rosé, there was the gold medalist uh -huh, that year. He was on their team. We hadn't even shaken hands, yeah. you know, so Aww. I had to get over and do that. It's one of the more awkward things. Lasik and I were very good friends at the time, a lovely, lovely guy. Um, and that's one of the great things about Davis Cup, too, just to, you go through these battles together, and we see it all the time here, too, just the nice moments afterwards between the players. You know, you mentioned, sorry, guys, you mentioned sort of it's, a, it's been a great U.S. Open. We have so many great storylines. Does American tennis still, I mean, look at that footage. That was, you were rock stars in the 90s. and. I, I just wonder if we're maybe on the verge of getting a little of that back with those boys that you mentioned. And the women have obviously had great success, yeah. too. Yeah, look, I hope so. I think the landscape is going to shift dramatically once the big three move along. And mm -hmm. I don't think, I mm -hmm. think that's probably four or five years away before the last of them will go, if I yeah. had to guess. I mean, it, Roger yeah. at 38, it's fair to say that Novak mm -hmm. And hopefully Rafa even can be still doing it at that age. So well, I think there's even a younger generation of American players like a Martin Dam yep. who's playing the juniors here that might be able to come up and have some impact as well. Um, I just I, I spare a thought for the, the players uh, like the Isners and the Quarries and, and the Steve Johnsons who have been playing in this era where there's just been a glass ceiling on everybody. Yeah. It's been tough to break through. In a lot of other eras, a lot of players would have popped up and won some majors. So it's just been hard because they've been so darn greedy. Yeah, they really yeah. have. So selfish. I feel totally. like when I watch that video, I think we need to bring back the white short shorts oh. that are many inches that's, above. That's what you think is that's, the key that's to that's the my analysis. <laughs> okay. That is my like that. clutch <laughs> analysis like of the day. Isn't Nadal doing that? Kind of. It's yeah, getting yeah. Shorter. Point, actually. The shorts, is, the shorts, yeah, they're getting a bit shorter. Well, if you're going to do wall squats, you need your, yeah, you know, you, 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 can't show you can't. I can't have the pirate shorts like I used to wear over the knees. I mean, you got to show off the hard work. We have one last question for you from Twitter. Every single day we do a, a Twitter question or a poll. So today it's a Twitter question. So my favorite U.S. Open experience was blank. My favorite U.S. Open experience? Wow. 
Um, this is loaded for you. For us, we've <laughs> yeah. got a few. No, we have fewer no, no. to choose from. <laughs> Look, there, there are a couple magical ones. I mean, one one really special moment for me, and it's bittersweet, was watching Andre's last match here. I had been retired oh. for five years or six years or so, but I was working in television. And I was up on the deck, not working that match, but just hanging around because I wanted to see him after the match and see how it all played out. And hearing his speech, and also realizing for me it was a, it was a, the end of my generation of, of American players. We were all about now gone. It's like we all had to be adults now. That was a little bit bittersweet, but also the pride that I felt for um, you know how we all kind of handled our business and and what our careers. I mean, Andre's most especially to the crowd. It was, it was so meaningful, was and uh, we were very lucky to be able to give him the opportunity to be involved in it. And for me, that that's a moment I'll always remember. Were there some tears? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had tears yeah. watching. I remember Same. that day. Up yeah, for sure. Everybody for sure. did. That's amazing yeah. that you chose that moment as opposed yeah, to not any one, of your own. one of your own personal. Yeah, moments. I mean, look, look. The easy one would be to just to point to the one we already talked about. Mm -hmm. The you know the right. the high high of having to face Jimmy Connors and be able to conquer that. You know, there are lots of those. And then there are other tough matches where I, I lost when I was number one seed. Cedric Peeling beat me in the fourth round. Mm. And that was one where I thought I really had a really sh good shot to win the title. And, and I just didn't perform, and he did. So, you know, there there's a lot of... Uh, of great and there's a lot of also mm. what could have been and that's I think every player will always have that of course mm. but overall I look at the US Open as just such a nice part of the journey of my life within tennis and to be, still be here um, being being here being able to witness history be made which is what we're lucky enough to do for, for work yeah we get to watch history unfold in front of our eyes I feel really lucky and uh, mm. and then my brother gets to be here tonight. My mom's oh, coming so in. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. yeah. Yeah. Family here. yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. He'll be out probably around five o'clock. Probably over there in the bar, actually. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I mean that's not a bad place for yeah. me, to be honest. Okay, yeah. parting shot. Jimmy, uh, Jim Courier's got to go here, but we've got we've got Dimitrov versus Fed tonight. Okay. okay. Here's Raj. Here's. Do you give Grigor any shot yeah. tonight? Got a hard He's time telling the difference. Yeah, I this know, is, right? This is um, Griggs. Here's Roger. Look, I mean. If Roger is not sharp, if he plays a little bit like he did in the opening set of his first two rounds, Grigor might be in there with a the chance. Um, I'm just happy to see Grigor back in the quarterfinals, yeah. moving <laughs> back into the top 50, uh, getting a little bit more positive momentum. He's one of the great guys in our sport. We, we do adore him and want him to succeed, and, and it's been a tough run for him as of late. So um, Fed's the obvious favorite. Mm. I don't expect that we're going to see an upset. <laughs> But, uh, Grigor, if you are watching, good news, I'm almost always wrong if I'm asked to make a prediction. So, and everybody's yeah. watching US yeah. Open now. I, I yeah. wish I was that handsome. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Me, you and yeah. me both. Uh, no, the always handsome uh, Jim Courier stopping by our US Open now. Sure. You're welcome back anytime, by the yeah, way. Yeah, this was wonderful. I didn't know you'd, you'd open up the door for yeah, me. You got like free coffee and everything. We have an everything. open door <laughs> policy, as you can tell. All yes, right. windows Thanks. along Keep the up side. the good work. Thank, Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the day of work today here at the U.S. Open. Yes.